Hello? Yeah. Hey, guess what? It's my birthday. I'm finally legal. Do you need to know anything about f***ing? And the little boy finally knew for certain that he was, in fact, going to really and truly die someday. I forgot to put words in my comic? That's what you think? I forgot? Why don't you die in your own vomit? You want a hand job, mister? Well, I grew up around LA, like mostly in East Hollywood. And you know, I grew up like a dirt poor kid, always getting bullied and living in bad areas. I grew up doing a lot of Super 8 movies and just filming with little cameras and things like that. And because I grew up in Los Angeles, like even when you're poor, you're just surrounded by these billboards and the billboards are always screaming this lotto ticket at you that you could be like famous, big director, big producer. So I had my eye on going to a big university because that was going to be the other side of the velvet rope. I just knew that if I got in there, they were never going to get rid of me. In California, if you do well in junior college, the community colleges that are almost free, you get to really write your ticket to any university in the state. I went to junior college for a long time and worked out the transfer agreement guarantee with UC San Diego. And that means that if you do really well and you have like a certain GPA, they will absolutely let you in. It doesn't matter how weird you are, and it doesn't matter if you're old. It doesn't matter anything. It just, they'll let you in. I ended up staying in the university system for a long time because I finally found out that if you want to be a real, like a filmmaker, there's always people around who will help, like crew. And also people who also are filled with like, dreams. They think like everything's possible when they're going to be leaving university. So you can talk to them about just all the wild things you have in mind. They had an open call meeting for this television station on campus at UC San Diego, SRTV. And I went there. It was immediately just like complete anarchy. Oh, shake it, shake it. Yeah, SpongeBob, that's so hot. I had no idea that this station had posited itself against the university. They're immune to prosecution from the university, no matter what they say or do, in order to have a complete free speech platform. And this one group of students called the Koala they were putting out this newsletter that was really, had a lot of tasteless stuff in it. They were taking advantage of this to every now and again put porno and things like that on the TV station. And the TV station broadcast directly to all of the campus and the dorm rooms. The university found this problematic. So they tried again and again to shut down SRTV. And I joined SRTV right when SRTV was kind of on the edge of about falling over. It made you feel like, okay, this is the zeitgeist of this station. I'm not really here to like start a career in professional broadcasting. I'm here to finally do some of the things in my head that otherwise would be inappropriate in polite society. The very first show I did there was called Hellhund. And it was a combination of little puppet bits I would film with this bath puppet. It looked like a little devil dog with horns, but very cute. And he would introduce bits and then I would show like surrealist movies from the Czech Republic and some other crazy stuff. I ran into this guy named Brian who was doing the robot puppets. And we just got together and said, why don't we do a live puppet show? And somehow we came up with live hot puppet chat. I'm not ready. I'm Head not off. ready. I'm not we ready. are live and we are hot and this is I'm the puppet ready. chat. I'm not ready. What we should do is a sex advice show where the puppets give the sex advice and it's very incomplete sex advice. In a sense, it's anti-advice. I know about the sex. If ever there was advice that they aren't going to get anywhere else, it's going to be right here, right now. So we had them take live calls from students who would stay up late and they would call in and just try the most shocking question you could think of. And really... <laughs> well, a hot call, simply put, is when you poop on someone's chest. <laughs> Who's this Carl? <laughs> we were doing it under a table at first, which made the show really like this endurance contest. 
being stuck under a table and holding the puppet up above the edge of the table. Brian ended up kind of leaving the show. So I started doing the show solo and I did it with uh, Skittles, who was the little poofy food allergic dog who was trying to be very nice. I know right now you're all studying very hard. How hard you're studying right now, that's how hard I have to study ingredient labels. The owl, the slug puppet who later became Albert. I'm getting a ton of mental exercise, just thinking of all the other things I could be doing right now. And I would just be under the table and just when I had to switch puppets, I would have one of them say goodbye and hop down and then bring up the next puppet. Uh, it was so much fun to do. And I'd gotten a couple really cool people on board that I was getting friends with at the university like Cy and Lance, and they were able to handle camera and able to handle that huge television mixing board. We were able to do live calls and title overlays and all these really cool things. And there was someone early on who really helped with it named Hong, and she was good. She was really gung-ho about it too. I'm gonna uh, hit you in the chin. Watch this. Oh. Yeah, fantastic. I Jesse was and is this really great guy. Jesse, are you a gay Jehovah's Witness? You wish. Jesse, was so deadpan in life and as a character. He was so deadpan, I just had to keep using him. Well, I, I've invented this this nifty little thing, which, um, if I might hook it up, we can all listen to Jobo but and hear his inner thoughts. The cosmic f visit our planet and trick people into giving free emo. We all just really got into the spirit of it somehow, because now there was no more table, I was just gonna bring the puppet up close to the camera and just position myself so that you never saw the arm. The Skittles was the first one that we did for uh, what became Live Hot Puppet Chat season two. Yay, it's Live Hot Puppet Chat season two. What? That, that was the, oh, okay, Hold, we'll do it again. It's Live Hot Puppet Chat, season two. That was, that was the music. Just those nights, every Tuesday night at midnight, we're getting into the studio at about 11.30, and I would buy these 32 ounce coffees. So I'd be just drinking this coffee all the way up till showtime. As you're watching the minute hand get closer to midnight, and you know that midnight is the drop dead go time. Oh, it was just, the greatest feeling of anxiety ever, like happy anxiety. So getting that caffeinated and then bouncing off of what the students were calling in and saying. I have gonorrhea in my ear and I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> uh, have you thought about suicide? <laughs> it was just this once in a lifetime kind of magical confluence of events because now I don't know where you'd get a TV station like that. And we didn't screen calls. So now the things that those students said on that show, man, that would get them kicked off campus now. Have you ever seen a donkey f a chick? Cause I saw that, I don't know, it turned me on, I don't know, kind of crazy. You're sick. <laughs> I think now like laughing at it is, I just I'm laughing at it in disbelief that that was ever something that we could do on live television. Sometimes daddy sits behind me in the bathtub as his penis floats into the crack in my bottom. <laughs> Thank you. You know, at the time, it's like with South Park, but also with Crank Yankers and Wonder Shows, and everyone was pushing the envelope, you know, to see what could be done, and there was, there was no penalty, not really. Everyone would understand that you were doing the thing that was like the other thing. So if you were doing something really tasteless, say it's about AIDS, then, well, because South Park just did one, right? And Crank Yankers just did one. It was all sort of part of that thing. But I never got the butt aids. I just got the throat aids a couple times. The Berry Bible episode that we did was the... M <laughs> it was the most toxic. I heard that some of you students get pretty wild. Berry Bible was not just a very severe and orthodox Christian. Stay in heaven, save your seed. He would list the reasons, which were the orthodox Christian reasons why you might go to hell. You're uh, gay. I, I've heard a lot of people say, gay people go to hell. Oh yeah. Now, I'm gay. <laughs> yeah, so. Don't go to hell? Yep. <laughs> the 
This is the easiest call I've had all night. You were Asian, right? If you're born in a part of the world that hasn't accepted Jesus, um, you know, bad luck. But what if like, some Asians did? Like, you know, found... Oh, they're the faking Lord. it. They think they could put one over on Jesus, but Jesus totally has their number. It's axiomatic that what Barry was saying was the things that, say, someone who is very, very orthodox and a literalist Christian would believe, but Barry was saying it in a very happy way, a very happy, confident way. Some say Jesus was black. What do you think about that? Ew, no way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Jesus didn't have chocolatey skin. And then people called in and it started getting worse and worse. People started thinking that, you know, there was like a racial angle to Barry's condemnation of who was going to go to hell. Are you okay. racist? Oh yeah. Heavily racist? Oh, I'm heavily racist, sure. There was a couple calls in particular where people would just call up and they would just kind of shout racial slurs. Sir, my message is simple. Niggas, Jews, homosexuals, Mexicans, Arab, and all kinds of shit. Keep going. And no, I keep going. Ah, if he names all ten, he gets one of those bite-sized Snickers. And Barry really had almost no opinion on this. Now, everything we said about Negroes is like we've said it all. It's now boring. Oh, no, no, we still haven't totally ripped on the gays and Asians enough. It was an episode that went very, very wrong, and we kept riding the car off the edge of the cliff. I'm a gay Asian Jew, and my oh boyfriend my is God. a black guy. The Holocaust was real. <laughs> No one's supposed to look at your wrinkles there. The lights are supposed to be out, and you're supposed to cut a hole in the sheet. Don't you read the Bible? So right after this, SRTV got hauled before this huge committee meeting because this was going to determine the fate of the autonomy of SRTV or whether or not SRTV was going to continue at all. I cannot say we mounted a really serious and sober defense of the television station. We just would expand on the idea that we get to do this because that is written into the contract of SRTV with the campus. So why is this meeting even taking place? Uh, you see, now I'm older, I would have gone in there and I would have tried to find any way possible to keep the television station going. But at the time, we were just kind of high on audience and high on freedom. So we did not set a really proper tone in there. So of course the Koala did another porno broadcast just to really put it to them. And that one got huge audience. It got national news. At the University of California, San Diego, they have student-run TV, which is broadcast in the dorms. The college funds it, students produce it, and now there's trouble. They hauled one of the koala guys onto Fox News with the Bill O'Reilly show for an interview. Do you want to go up to San Fernando Valley and get into the porn industry? Oh, it's something I would consider. Can we consider that. All right. <laughs> UC San Diego was synonymous with porno broadcasts for a little while. You know, once the TV show and the TV station shut down, I, I had this idea that the puppets, the characters, there was just so much more to say. I think when you're with friends and you're doing a project like Live Hot Puppet Chat, nothing's going to be anything that really speaks to you. You know, you're not going to lay out all your philosophical and existential cards on the table because you're just there with friends having fun doing a sex advice show with puppets. But then, when that stopped, then you're really by yourself with those puppet characters and everything is going to be now the thing that's really in your head and just in your own head, especially when you're making independent, micro-budget, surrealist, existentialist puppet movies. Um, I'm really sorry to begin. A major motion picture this way, but um, there's something that you need to know about first. Okay. Giddles, the dog, wants to do this version of the King Arthur legend, but he wants to do it in a way that's very, very calm. Because the real problem with all movies made about King Arthur is just that it's so noisy. 
but he did not have any money. So what he did is he hired a Chinese video store that had a post-production facility in the back of it because they would do it really, really cheap. And then he also had the other puppets send their tapes of what they did. Then what comes back is this mess that he has to apologize for. What did this movie look like in your head? <laughs> I'm serious. That movie is just, the original version is just such a mess. It became like the ultimate crash landed vanity project because it had to fail on all these levels in order for the Skittles train wreck of him attempting the movie to be kind of real. And yet I was having too much fun doing parts of the movie that were obviously not part of that whole storyline. I, I was just wondering what the rest of your body looks like. Why is there evil in the world if God's loving? <laughs> so medical work, huh? That's gotta be exciting. And then I just knew that Dobo was, he's just, he's like a catalyst for existential situations. If, yeah. If very, I, very good, Dobo. <laughs> Dobo was a ministry puppet who, when he showed up and I took him out of the box, it was clear something went wrong in the making of this particular copy of that puppet model because he did not look happy. He was wearing a sweatshirt that said, God has a plan for me. And it was clear that whatever that plan was, it was going to do him harm. And he knew it. And he just had that look of staring into the headlights of the oncoming truck of fate. So of course, I had to start making movies with him as the lead. The next movie I did was just the most existential situation I could think of. Someone who thinks they're dying. And so they were remembering back to when they were a little kid, when they had all their pets die, and they had made a vow to themselves that they were going to grow up and become a scientist in order to cheat death and he instead went just the usual paycheck route and he was doing focus testing for a video game company but now he wanted to go back to that original desire to live forever through science so he just thought if he could invent a pinball machine that would be a very very cool advertisement to the scientific community that the perfect form for living forever would be to encase your memories and your brain digitally within a pinball so in order to get into that childhood state of creativity he starts downing a lot of alcohol and cough syrup and that leads him yeah I just need to calm down. That movie happened to coincide with me moving into a, an apartment which had no real furniture for the living room. So it became this empty room to do this whole puppet movie in for most of a year. Be still my beating heart. Is that the banana color of the Donkey Kong 64 cartridge? I hooked it up and okay you tell me how you even begin to explain the mandatory RAM expansion pack for DK64 paradigm to an angry drunk who already probably punched you once. Dobo winds up with his divorced and bitter and semi-alcoholic father for this particular summer but whether Dobo is real, it's all up in the air because so much of Dobo's behavior and his inner thoughts might be coming from the father's imagination. And maybe he never even had a son. He's just alone in this apartment after the divorce and he's so disappointed in life that he starts to see himself from the outside. Like his childhood self is now there in the room observing him and judging him. Or it may be that Dobo is entirely real. And the movie has no illusions whatsoever. It's just sort of like Blade Runner. And what was fun about doing some of the Chew Toy Soul was feeling bad for Dobo. He was in that vortex of a summer where nothing really could happen for him, but also really envying it because I have no idea what it's like anymore. So getting to revisit what it was like to have nothing but empty free time and that it was both wonderful and horrible when you're a little kid was really fun.
call this room the afterlife because part of you has to die in here. The hook is immediately apparent, which is that this puppet is sinister. It's acting really friendly and chipper, but it's part of a very, very sinister cult. I do think that it is something where you don't have to really look inside yourself. Of course we're going to deactivate your penis for this much pain and invisible injury of past. This one is, yeah, just blasphemy after blasphemy. God knew all the names of all the secret pedophilia groups that were going to be on Facebook before there was even a solar system. Barry was really ripe for a movie. Jack. Making out the size of I was in an MFA program, and I decided as the main project for it, I would do a Barry Bible movie. This vexed the department to no end because it was a program to actually do gallery art. I couldn't help it. I was making Jesus Hates You Now and just coming in with chunks of the movie and just showing them chunks of the movie and then just telling them, yeah, that's what I did. No one in the art department is going to try to grab your steering wheel at all. Whereas in the film school, everyone is trying to steer your car a little bit. But in an art department, you're there to subvert everything and become a completely subjective animal with your own complete playbook of strangeness and no one will interfere. In fact, they will applaud you the stranger it gets. Chill and 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 chill. And chill. Having done those, all those puppet movies, I can't remember really what my expectations were, what they might do for my future. I would just have to make them and do them in the way that seemed to make sense at the time. And then after doing all of them and realizing, wait a second, I could be doing these kinds of movies forever and just have to do terrible little jobs. And I'd have a, a little noisy apartment somewhere and I would just keep doing these strange puppet movies that I could never really sell. And that started to seem scarier to me, that I'm always going to be poor and I'm always going to have to tell people I make puppet movies, which to 90% of the population, what that means is you do either silly movies or movies for kids. So you could say, I do surrealist existentialist puppet movies, and then they just want to punch you. This is, <laughs> it's really a no-win situation. So I decided to make a movie to warn myself about this, and it was going to be, and might still end up being, the last puppet movie I ever make. And welcome to what might be the greatest comedy movie of all time. I had the puppet think that they're going to do this great movie and they end up in a cul-de-sac of irrelevance. You're being a moron. No, you're the moron. <laughs> this is the comedy pot. He's the ghost of some black kid I killed <laughs> accidentally. If I'm so skilled at comedy, what does that make me? Some kind of antichrist? I just saw what happens to this puppet is really going to be what happens to me. I'm going to be driving around Hollywood doing food delivery and yelling at the billboards like, just you wait, just you wait. I'm going to, when I get to the Academy Awards, baby, I'm going to be telling you all how long you ignored me and I'm going to get my revenge. So I made a movie about a puppet that is going down that path. It was a little bit to warn myself about it, but it was also a little bit to find humor in what might be my eventual fate. I'm going to get another meeting because I'm walking in there with an Academy Award. I'm going to slam that Oscar on the table and say, now who's the joke? Now who's telling who left off the time I got? Thanks for coming by. That was a strange one. Because when I released it, it felt like this empty gesture. Like I had, I had made it, and I would love people to see it. But l releasing things online, there's just no moment. It's just a suddenly you upload it, and then you click publish. 
And that little noise of like clicking a mouse is just like the, that little click. It's just, okay, there's my premiere. So that movie was kind of the big question mark, but also kind of the big slap in the face of, you just spent a year of your life making this movie and you just clicked publish and there it is. So I just knew something had to change. So after doing Hell Leaks Laughter, I, I'd been reading a lot of theater autobiographies. It seems so obvious that that's the life, where you want to have the most life experience, the most satisfaction, the highest peaks and lowest lows, then you want to become a stage performer. So I wanted the theater life, but how do I get the theater life if I haven't done any theater at all? So I applied for the PhD program in theater at UC Santa Barbara. And I went to the department and offered myself as a PhD student, just plopped down and started talking to the faculty there. And they were really amused by this because there was no chance in hell. And they were, were nice. They were just like, no. Well, I'm not sure how this happened, but the university gave me a scholarship. And so the theater department said, oh, well, wait a second, we can have him as a grad student and our department does not have to pay for it at all. It's just the university is going to front the tab. So welcome, Tristan, welcome to the UCSB theater department. So suddenly I was there in a PhD theater department with no theater background and catching up, catching up, reading, 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 and then do all these things to try to dog paddle and stay afloat. They had this thing called the New Works Lab where students could submit a play they wanted to do and it would get produced like a main stage play at the department, which means it was going to have resources, it was going to have faculty staff, it was going to have actual ticket sales, it was going to have the whole nine yards. And so I submitted a play, people trying to demonstrate a video game that was going to go really, really wrong. I got selected for it and as we were going through the various iterations of writing it, and having to perform it for this class. And then somehow I decided, what if Al presented the video game, but it can't be a puppet now? Because of the setup, I have to do it as a human. I ended up doing Albert on stage in this New Works play, and the very first time of doing him as a, a live character and getting the mannerisms down. So he, that's where he first appeared, was in this one-act play called The Last Video Game. So creating this love-hate character it was just now I kind of got bitten. So then I did that first Albert video right after the show closed. That first one, which was The Secret of Tortilla Chips. I did stand-up comedy for 20 years and never got famous, right? But I've been in a lot of clubs, a lot of bars and restaurants. I got all their secrets. Here's one you need to know. Tortilla chips. It's all the same chip. And so then I uploaded that one to this new channel called Never Got Famous and somehow that video made it to the front page of Reddit on the videos section and just kind of blew up a bit. It's so weird how that happens and so many more people have seen that video than have seen all my other stuff combined. Doing stand-up comedy for 20 years, I should have had all this. Good. Uh, one day I am coming up there, and I'm going to come back down, covered in rich person blood. <laughs> you will watch this goddamn show. Albert is very successfully inhabiting one half of my brain all the time. If you're someone who's really busy-brained by nature, you have every thought with an anti-thought that contradicts it. Albert is just this one half of the dialectic that's everything deliciously honest and naive and complete self-absorbed solipsistic hatred of things you just don't like. You don't like the garbage music. You don't like superhero movies. So those things are a justification for nuclear war. Well, you know what? Wave bye-bye to your kids and your families and everyone, because I'm getting Russia to fire the nukes tomorrow, right? I'm doing emails all night long, right to the Kremlin, baby. And I'm going to tell them, do it, do it. Scrub the planet clean of life forms or your chicken. Now, the other half of your brain is saying, um, no, it's not. It's not a justification for nuclear war. People like what they like. No, you just dismiss all of that and you go right into condemnation and speculation of things. It's charming because of course it's half right. It is half correct. And the other part of the brain is half correct. 
and you put them together and then you have both sides of every argument and that's when you become very tolerant and compassionate because you see that we're all sort of products of our own delusions. Albert is just delicious because he wallows in a failure that I get to make fun of because it's happening to him now. It's not really happening to me. Right? So Albert never getting famous the same way that I made those strange puppet movies for years and not many people know who I am. Albert is really, really vexed by that, by this fictional 20 year comedy career. And he takes all of that. I can just now watch him and be amused by someone who would let that completely color their perspective on the world. But because he's so fixed without that other half of the brain interfering, he's got no interference by the what if and you shouldn't and the other things. So he's the half of the brain that I think if I had all my inhibition switches turned off, I'd be doing that. So I get to live vicariously through him and that's kind of reason why I think he's so prolific. He gets to do all these things and I get to come along for the ride. How would you describe your output looking back on it? Um, hmm. yeah. Someone is choking with laughter on the reference to ball wrinkles. I think it's the... Beep beep hooray through with thy day. That is a really stunning question. It might take me a moment. Ah, uh, you, you are the biggest idiot. Oh my God, what an idiot. People who wanted to do these kinds of projects, media projects, movies, and they wound up doing them professionally. You wonder if they wonder, what would it have been like if they had instead of all of this structure and all of this composite committee collaboration product what if they had been by themselves and they had the freedom like the way that novelists have the freedom to do whatever they want it's a really really lucky break to just be at the time when you can do all these things on your own and then set them free out there in some just instantaneous global distribution <laughs> it's just, it's so bizarre even to still think of that, that it goes that way. All I know is that it's just, it's such a tribute to solitude. Yeah, if there's one thing that all of it is, where does everything you want to do go when everyone else leaves and you're just by yourself with your thoughts and you still want to communicate, you still want to express, but there's no one there anymore. So now you can just really dig deep into your brain and get out all the bits no one's around to like poke at you and condition your thoughts with their thoughts now it's isolation i think everything comes from that all, all the projects just learning what it's like to really be alone in the cosmos like what if this is it what if i was really really alone what would i populate my brain with what would i populate this empty world with and I think I would populate it with surrealist existential puppet movies and audiobooks about someone trying to do Muppet movies without permission.